So again, we appreciate you joining us and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Tom Kawula and Dr. Sylvia Amulo, both from the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health. And they're gonna be talking to us today about uh, COVID-19 and the developing world. So with that, Tom, would you be willing to kick us off with an overview of the school? Sure. I'm unmuted, excellent. Um, hi everyone, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. It's good to see all of your pictures, <laughs> um, most, most uh. pictures, names everyone. Um, just real briefly, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health, we're, um, you know, we're a, a primarily a research education unit within the College of Veterinary Medicine at Washington State University. Our research mission centers around that um, that area that, that basically bridges animal health and human health. So, so typically most sort of health oriented research operations tend to focus on one or the other, animal health or focus on human health. Um, our goal, our mission is to, is to bridge that gap. And that's in recognition of, of the important impact that animal health has on human health as well. So, Within our studies, you know, we seek to leverage opportunities to make improvements in animal health that will likewise improve uh, both human health and human ec economic equities, equities um, um, throughout, throughout the world, really, um, which is why we're a global animal health. Um, so as a, as a research unit around these things, so there's, you can kind of look at it probably two basic parts that, that, um, that we look at that bridge that gap. One is pretty easy to see, which is our, our research, some of our research focus on zoonotic diseases. And zoonotic disease is just another word to, say, to describe diseases that can be transmitted from an animal host directly or indirectly through, you know, through indirect contact to a human host. So the disease, uh, there's probably a pretty good example that most of you are pretty well aware of right now. Uh, where or a viral or a bacterial or parasitic disease can be transmitted directly from, from an animal host to a human host and then cause human disease. And so there's, uh, we have a fair bit of research that focuses on those zoonotic diseases. Um, the, the other part is more of that indirect impact. So when you look at uh, impact of animal health on human health, that also is, there's a lot of, of, of economies and human economies, household economies that are very much driven or very much rely upon animal health. And the easiest examples is to think about livestock health or people um, who raise animals and those animals that are important, you know, foundation for the economy of that household. And, um, and of course, this is particularly, it's important everywhere, but it is particularly important or particularly acute uh, within um, more developing nations or resource poor, resource poor uh, countries where there tends to be uh, more small animal shareholders. And so, uh, so we, we do have a lot of research that focuses on that, again, the impact of, uh, of the animal health on the human economy. So, so you might guess, and it, and it is true, that when we approach these things, there is no one discipline that adequately addresses these issues. And so, um, so within the Allen School, I think something that makes us unique and something that's exciting for a person like me um, to be around is that we have a, a number of different disciplines that we rely on to address important questions uh, around this uh, animal and human health. So we have basic scientists like my, I'm a laboratory scientist. I look at mechanisms of disease, how are, how are bacterial pathogens transmitted from animals to humans? How do they break down immune systems and things like that? Um, but we also have within our school, we have, um, we have epidemiologists that look at transmission. We have, um, anthropologists. So when we start to get into areas where there are cultural impacts on, on disease transmission or tr disease prevention, it's important to have uh, an anthropological uh, uh, outlook on that, on that uh, sort of research. Uh, we have disease ecologists, uh, economists, um, and computer modelers. And computer modelers are pretty prominent in the, in the public, uh, public view these days. Uh, and they play a very important role in what we do as well. So we have many different disciplines that we use to, to approach these questions. And then finally, what, what I finish with in, in talking a little bit about us, and I think is also quite relevant to our discussion today, is pretty obvious recognition, I think, that diseases don't, 
don't recognize boundaries of you know international boundaries or country boundaries. So we have a lot of our research takes place in Washington State, but we also have faculty that are either located in and or doing research have ongoing research pro, uh, pro, programs. Excuse me, uh, in places like Bangladesh and Guatemala, uh, Argentina, um, and in the Eastern African countries of Tanzania and Kenya, and which is probably a great segue to move on to. Uh, uh, my, my, my compatriot here, Sylvia Omulo, who um, I'm, will, I'm sure will introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her work and her connection with us. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Tom. Uh, very nice introduction because it makes it easy for me to introduce a Kenyan program. Uh, so I'm Sylvia Mulo, an assistant professor at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health. Uh, I'm currently in Pullman because I have some teaching responsibilities in Pullman. So I teach the public health course to second year veterinary students in the spring. Uh, but I spend the rest of the year in Kenya where I lead research on and surveillance projects on antimicrobial resistance, which is one of the broad focus areas for the WSU Global Health Kenya program, which I will give a brief uh, overview about. So the WSU Global Health Kenya program represents a public health mission of WSU in the Republic of Kenya. And it focuses on linkages between human health and the health of animals, as well as their environment. Um, the program is focused on three broad areas. One is antimicrobial resistance, which I have just mentioned. And uh, the goal of that program is to mitigate the emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. And most of the work we do is really aligned to the Kenya National Action Plan on the containment of uh, antimicrobial, on, on the containment and control of antimicrobial resistance. We also have projects that, uh, the, the other broad area is on uh, disease surveillance. So uh, uh, we are looking at uh, novel ways to diagnose emerging and endemic uh, uh, diseases. That is diseases that, are, that occur frequently in, in um, the, uh, the Kenyan region. And uh, the whole goal of that is to be, be to be able to detect them early enough to control them. And for zoonotic diseases, the most important factor is to detect them early enough before spillover events happen from animals to, to humans. And some of the diseases we look at or we, surveil, uh, we conduct surveillance for include anthrax, brucellosis, the Middle East respiratory uh, coronavirus, as well as rabies. Those are just some of the some of the diseases we look at. Uh, we also have we also focus on enhancing things like food security, emphasizing on maternal and child health. And that's actually where livestock contribute to the to that greater picture. So we look at how livestock really contributes to maternal and child health and well-being. And our success has largely been uh, attributed to long established collaborations with key institutions in Kenya, including the Ministry of Health. Uh, the Kenya Directorate of Veterinary Services, the University of Nairobi, Kenya Medical Research Institute, as well as other players in the research and, and health uh, scene, uh, also focus on global health. And we attribute the attainment of these objectives to funding we receive from various sources, including the Allen Foundation, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health. We have a host of, of funding institutions, uh, and it just goes to to showcase the strength of the program that uh, that is in Kenya or outside outside of the US. Um, and some of that work actually involves working with vulnerable groups. Uh, and these are communities living in informal settlements or rural areas, or communities that are forced to move around in search of pastures for their livestock. And that's important because when you talk about pandemics, these become a special interest group to look at because they have um, varied access to healthcare as well as resources and therefore tend to be disproportionately impacted when we look at pandemics. That is if you compare them to the general population. So over to you, Haley. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Uh, so our first question, Dr. Amulo, what are the implications of COVID-19 on healthcare, socioeconomic priorities and other issues in developing countries? Uh, so I'll, I'll look at those in the positive as well as negative aspects. So uh, starting with healthcare, some of the things I would say are 
positive is, um, and I'll talk about how a positive in terms of the work we do uh, in, in Kenya as well. So as an institution, we've been able to leverage some of our existing surveillance studies. I mentioned that we look at influenza and mass coronavirus. These are based within hospital facilities. So using these, these studies, we've been able to support health workers in the fight against COVID-19. And that support has mainly been in form of patient management, provision of PPE testing, modeling the incidence of disease, uh, in various counties and that we've been able to give back to to the to the communities that that we serve and this matters because often researchers are seen as uh, data extractors who don't directly give back so this has really provided us an opportunity to give directly give back to society in a way that they they appreciate there've also been improvements in infection control and prevention practices and that uh, that goes to that plays a major role not just for the control of covid but other uh, uh, transmissible diseases within within healthcare facilities and that's because it's been increased access to water and hygiene products as well as personal protective equipment where those have been uh, have been available people have also tended or healthcare workers have also tended to be more focused on personal hygiene and that has benefited not just the healthcare workers but also patients because transmission can happen uh, both ways there's also been a streamlining of the healthcare system uh, right now there's there's a clear uh, there's some form of clear guidance for how things move from point a from, uh, from point a to b if you're suspected there's a clear uh, a clear mm -hmm system for how patients are moved through through the system and it's also helped in uh, easing congestion from referral facilities because previous to covid before covid 19 uh referral facilities were accepting walk-in patients which is not the function of referral facilities uh, with the covid 19 there's been streamlining of that and that allows referral facilities to really handle cases that require the resources of or referral facilities. Now, when you come to the negative in terms of healthcare, um, we've we've been able to give back to hospital facilities. But when it comes to communities, we had to pull out our staff when this pandemic started, and that was because. Uh, remember these are people with families as well and if they keep moving within households and they're infected or they get uh, they uh, they're exposed to a household then that kind of changes how how the disease is managed and that goes back to that question of researchers are here to collect data not give back because by pulling them out then we kind of affirmed that yes we are actually just interested in the data which which is not what uh, what we what what we, we our focus is on but it's it's about protecting um, our our staff as well there's been a rise in vaccine preventable diseases uh, because when supply chains were were disrupted then there were other things that were disrupted as well so and uh, it's not just vaccine pre preventable diseases some countries like i think mali i was in another call with uh, another group and um I think it's a person from UNICEF in Mali that reported that there've been a threefold increase in maternal deaths since COVID-19 started. And that's attributable to the fear of going to hospital facilities during the, uh, the pandemic. There's also been uh, social, me uh, social distancing measures that have meant fewer people can ride in public transport that has increased fare. So that whole dynamic has, has prevented people from going to hospitals. There's been a shortage of healthcare workers, some who contract disease and die, and others who are just afraid of COVID and, and other things. And um, that also ties into what was seen during the HIV pandemic, where there was increased for, uh, funding and focus on HIV, and it took uh, focus away from other, other diseases. So that's happening for COVID as well. Border closures and, uh, and scarcity of uh, personal protective equipment has also been a main, uh, a major, a major issue for healthcare workers uh, who've been forced sometimes to improvise or work without some of these critical supplies. Uh, when it comes to socioeconomic priorities, and I'll go through this very quickly, some of the positives are that we've had, uh, people have discovered how to make masks or how to improvise PPE. So it's benefited some entrepreneurs. So 
while other people have lost jobs and people have gained employment in that way uh, people have also found alternative ways of communicating or alternative ways of working and this could also be dangerous because when employers <laughs> discover that oh you can actually do this work at home or they, they ask why they pay rent to to have you come to a to a facility so that is positive as well as as well as negative there's also been some orderliness in the public transport system and for those of you who visited some of these countries you can you know that uh, the public transport system can be really chaotic right now there's an order people have to queue and uh, leave spaces in between there's a hand washing station before you get into a public transport uh, facility uh, and uh, you have to wear a face mask so there's been some orderliness in that sector the negative of course is that there have been loss of economic opportunities especially for people who live on that day-to-day -day wage and that that really strikes the kenyan population really hard special holidays have been disrupted so this year we didn't have easter ramadan is currently happening and those are important holidays for for some of some of our cultures uh, a spike in domestic violence is also another factor and that's also been seen I, i've seen cases of that reported in the u.s as well uh, covid 19 like hiv also has some stigma attached to it so that's that's other that's another negative socioeconomic um, impact and lastly just that fear of quarantine uh, ha has kept people from accessing uh, hospitals as well as just uh, socializing but at a safe distance yeah so i emphasize when sylvia says the fear of quarantine and it so every every country is different but so in kenya in mm -hmm. you know correct me if i'm wrong if, if you test positive, they take you and put you in quarantine. It's not like you yes. get to go home and shut the door. So. No. <laughs> and that was because initially people had been asked to self-quarantine and they had signed forms that they would self-quarantine, but no one was doing that. And so the government cracked down on that. So now if you're, if you're found to be infected, you're taken to uh, designated quarantine facilities. The challenge with that is that you pay for that, for that service. So People don't want to show up to hospitals because if they take your temperature and you have a fever, you'll be taken to those facilities, then that has an economic expense as well. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kula, I'll look to you for the next one. What are the future implications of this virus on the developing world? Well, it's, it's, it's a great question. And I, you know, if I had a perfect crystal ball, I'm sure, you know, I could impress you all with a, with a, with a very cogent answer. Um, I, I, we probably can look to history a little bit though and, and predict certainly some things, certain things. And I think uh, one of which is it's likely to be much more prolonged impact in this area and these areas than they are uh, in places like the US and Europe that are going to throw a lot of money at the problem. Uh, there will be rapid back, you know, as rapidly as possible vaccine development. Um, you know, the communication is, well, you, you would hope it was clear. Um, it, so things like that, when, when you look into uh, more of the resource poor countries around the world, you know, they are still very much, you know, many of them are dealing with diseases that we don't even think about anymore in the US. So think about brucellosis as you know as an example where you know in many parts of Africa, many parts of Asia as well, you know, it's still endemic and still uh, you know a significant cause of morbidity and mortality, not just within animals but in but in humans as well. And and but in in the US and Europe we've got you know, very stringent control measures that pretty much have these diseases under, under control. You can look to TB, you can look to, you, we can look to a number of other diseases that we just don't think about too much here in the US anymore and are still really significant uh, issues there. And, and then we tend to sort of think, well, once we have a vaccine, and so there's a lot of talk about having a good vaccine in, in, in the media these days, once we have a good vaccine, we're gonna clear the path, everything's gonna be good. Well, we've got good vaccines for diseases that are still endemic in, in developing countries. I think rabies is a, is a great example. We don't think about rabies in the US because we get all our dogs vaccinated from it, but human rabies is still a significant issue. And in, uh, in a lot of both African and South American countries and in Asia as well. And so we have a vaccine, we know how to control, we actually know how to completely, how to control that disease and we have the tools to do it. 
And yet in developing countries, that's still, there's, it's still an, an endemic problem and a significant cause of disease. So it, it, it is probably just one more layer, one more of these infectious diseases, I think is, is likely to linger uh, because of that. Thank you. Dr. Amulo, uh, can you tell us how the virus is being tracked in developing nations? And part B of that is the ability to trace it more difficult because international aid organizations resources were pulled back for global support. Thanks, Haley. Um, so I think tracking varies by different countries and it really depends on the resource availabilities as well as the level of preparedness of, of individual countries. So using Kenya as an example, I would say um, the telecommunication companies have really helped with the tracking process, especially contact contact tracing. Uh, the whole tracking process has really been a joint effort, uh, combined efforts involving various ministries, that is the Ministry of Health, the IT uh, Information Technology Ministry, the Ministry of Defense, the transport sector, uh, and all these have worked together to kind of find out, so who's infected and how do we get to, to their contacts. Uh, the biggest challenge has been that individuals have been hiding because of the way the whole process is, is conducted. So when a contact or when someone is suspected as positive and pos positives can be identified at various, uh, various points, either uh, at, uh, initially it was at uh, screening points at the airports when, um, the air when the airports were, were still open. So there was a temperature kind of uh, uh, screening um, uh, those temperature screening that was happening at, at those points and when someone was con, con, uh, was was found to be positive or to uh, to uh, found to have fever they were asked to uh, to go to a quarantine facility and from that they would look at how many other contacts the person had and that way contact tracing tracing happened uh, with the border closures now whenever a case is identified they try to look at where does that case come from do they live within a household those um, then they test the people within that household or they move them to a quarantine facility and monitor them um so that has really been a, a joint effort by the various uh, the, the various um the various uh, sectors in in the country uh the ability to trace it uh it has been a little difficult um yes because that effort requires requires financing and uh, with COVID-19 the government was forced to kind of reshuffle its its um, its financing so money that would otherwise have gone to development or to other sectors have been forced to come into into COVID prevention and containment and uh, that has meant then that if we don't have any other sources and remember um, some of our economies depend on tourism and uh, foreign foreign exchange, uh, including including just remittances from people abroad. And when that stopped, when any form of international uh, international support was stopped or reduced, that has impacted how well we are able to to conduct uh, or to track to track cases. But some level of tracking is is happening. Yeah. Yeah, I think. It, uh, you know, Kenya is a good example, I think, of a of a developing country that knows what should be done, and is uh, I, and I think they've been reasonably reasonably transparent about it. Uh, it's there are developing countries where leadership is just denying that it's present there, all right. And there's um, and that is a completely different issue. And that you know, so there are solutions to the problems that. that they're facing in Kenya, you know, when there's at least an openness and a recognition of what the problem is and how, you know, how it needs to be addressed. But there are also places in the world uh, where the, you know, the leadership is just is denying the fact that it's present. And then, and so what the impact is going to be there on the population where it clearly is present, but they're just, you know, not, they're just denying it is, it will be you know, interesting in a not good way to, to see what the long-term ramifications of that are. And I think what has also helped Kenya is that uh, we've had 
we've had um, a support for, to set up surveillance systems for diseases such as influenza, which have caused pandemics before. And having set up centers like these, and uh, for, for example, we have a national influenza center, which is under the Ministry of Health. And so when COVID-19 started, this became the main, the main um, institution of focus for, uh, for, for testing. So resources for influenza were not just used for influenza initially, but also used to kind of look at how many of those cases, uh, how many of those samples that are collected for under routine surveillance also, in, uh, also COVID-19 COVID positive. So that helped because there was funding for influenza work from the WHO as well as the, the CDC. And, uh, uh, at least we were not starting from ground zero, which which was really useful. Yeah. Thank you. And we just had a question come into the chat. Um, Dr. Kula, I'll look to you for this one. Do you have any update on WSU's Dr. Bosch's research on decreasing the inflammatory response to COVID-19? Dr. Bose, yes, Centeno Bose, yes. Uh, Centeno is in the veterinary microbiology pathology department, a colleague of ours. And he is, um, so we don't have, to, he does not have direct um, data yet on the impact of the drugs that he's testing on the inflammatory response uh, produced by the virus. Um, so we, as you might guess, uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 needs to be handled under pretty stringent uh, conditions. And so when the Allen School, we have BSL-3 laboratories that are designed specifically to work with agents such, like, such as this that can be transmitted through aerosol, you know, through aerosol mechanism. Um, so we are, we are, we, we have the virus, we're setting up the experiments to work with that. We're currently training people in his lab to go into the BSL-3 facilities to do, to do that research. So um, I would expect results before terribly long. So in scientific terms, before long, um, in, in US <laughs> media terms, it'll be forever. But, but, <laughs> um, but, so, but, but we are carefully setting up the ability to actually do those experiments. Thank you. Dr. Mulo, is the illness from the virus or a lack of funding from tourism, aid agencies, government support, et cetera, having a larger impact on developing nations? Uh, so currently we, we have uh, just over a thousand cases. I would put it at a thousand one hundred cases in Kenya and uh, I think about 60 deaths. I'm not sure about the number of deaths, but I think it's right around that region. Uh, so we we have been hit harder by the ramifications of COVID-19 than with the disease itself. It does not mean the disease will not, uh, will not uh, spread. We are actually seeing a spread, but uh, I think the effects of the disease itself have been, have been harder uh, because we've received, uh, so there's been limited support uh, from uh, international aid agencies as well as uh, just the decrease in tourism sector in the tourism sector people have lost jobs uh, and it's kind of created a a dent in in the economy so yes the illness from the virus has had an impact but it's not as big as an impact as the the spillover event so the farmers who are initially exporters of uh, produce like um, like flowers, fruits, herbs, I've not been able to get those out uh, out of the market because there's been a kind of, uh, there are time restrictions between which people can work and just demand from different countries has also fallen because people are not, some people have been laid off work and so people's um, disposable income uh, or money they would have used for other things are not is not uh, is not is now not available and when demand uh, demand reduces in that case even if there are means or there was a means to export some of those those produce um, yeah some of those products it becomes a challenge to to do so so yes we have been hit but harder by the e effect of it rather than the disease yeah Thank you. Dr. Kuula, how are international travel restrictions impacting the research being done in these nations? Um, negatively impact. <laughs> um, I think, so 
so one of our models has been, so even though Sylvia is in Pullman, she's supposed to be in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, and, and, and well, so this is, and this is an issue that's come up before, and it's one of the reasons we're trying to do things a little bit differently in that we actually have WSU faculty are located internationally. So Kenya, again, is a, is a great example. We have at least, we have four faculty members who reside and do research in Kenya. So us, myself, maybe some of the who, you know, I, I was going to be there right now, but clearly mm -hmm. I'm not. Um, it, it, but that is, that is not, that does not impede research as much as if, if everyone who was conducting research, field research in Kenya were here in Pullman when this, when everything shut down. So actually we, we have restricted some of the research activity more because of the virus and less because of travel restrictions. Um, so, and, and I think this is an important model. So, you know, we're, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, really some of the positives going on in Kenya. And, and, and a lot of that is, is because there's some infrastructure there and there's, there's scientists there, there's uh, uh, health experts that are um, aware of the problem, who understand the problem, who understand the approaches to address the problems. Um, so it's, you know, we have taken the approach of, of, of trying to locate faculty in places so that, so that they recognize that we're, we have a commitment with them. And it's not just, as Sylvia had mentioned before, we're not just data extractors. Um, so our faculty there play a large role in helping to train other scientists and young scientists within in country um, to try and alleviate you know this particular problem and and we have we actually have training grants recently that fund this so us together with the University of Nairobi have uh, an NIH funded training grant that's going to train a collection of both MDs and veterinarians together uh, in zoonotic disease research and and so to participate in building up that uh, the knowledge and talent base in country. Uh, so when things like this happen, travel restrictions do need to come into play to, to prevent the, the transmission of disease. But then we don't just leave places without the expertise to, to actually um, facilitate the study and solving the, the problems in country. Um, more of the problem for us has been supplies. Um, the uh, you know the way the pandemic exploded on us i'm sure everyone on the zoom is aware and heard about the sudden need and shortage of ppe um and and we're not the only ones that need ppe the you know our you know our teams in in kenya who are nationals that we've hired to help do the research they need ppe as well when they are they are uh, meeting patients, they're meeting people who they're screening for disease, just like everyone else. And, and so it's more been the shortage of, of that kind of material. And so and Sylvia has talked about, you know, the testing in Kenya, um, the testing supplies are limited. And, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to develop those supplies and develop things in country to be able to, you know, to do more testing, more widespread testing. So, um, I think for us, it's been less of a people moving issue as it has been a materials moving issue. Thank you. Uh, we just had another question come in the chat. What are your thoughts on the mRNA vaccines currently in clinical trials? You want that one, Sylvia? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think this is one of those. So it's a that's a it's a um, so that's an interesting um, concept that's been out there for quite a while of basically getting the cell your uh, vaccinate with something where you, you then use your own your own cellular material to make uh, antigens that can you know that uh, that you can develop develop a response to and and whether or not those are antigens to proteins of the virus or nucleic acids of the virus they're going to help kill the cells that are infected. Um, there's a lot of proof of concept out there that, that looks like in some cases these things can work and other cases they're not so effective. I think it's, it's, it's one very important tool of which we need to, need to have many. 
Um, right now is the time, I think, to take uh, many known and more experimental approaches to, to rapidly develop uh, an effective vaccine. And I suspect in the end, there will probably be a few uh, that, that work uh, and may work better in combination as well. Um, the fact that they've shown development of antibody in response to the vaccine, that is a good step, all right? That is a, that is a positive step. Now you want to know if those antibodies actually do something to, to, to control the virus. You'd also like to know if they make T cells. So, so immunity to viruses is often mediated importantly by T cells, which is not, doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, so antibody is important and could be sufficient, but you're also usually going to need a good T cell response as, as well to, in order to control an ongoing viral infection. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the subject, in your expert opinion, do you think that COVID-19 started in bats or can it be traced back to another source? <laughs> I'm not the kind of expert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I anticipated this question. <laughs> so what I did was I, I did what, what most, I don't know, I'll give myself credit for this. I found someone who should know the answer to this. And the person I found, uh, so Stephanie Seifert is, uh, uh, actually, a faculty member is going to be he's going to be joining us as a new faculty member uh, this this fall. So we, I'm going to tell I'm going to like wave our flag here for a second. We, with great foresight this year, before this all hit, we hired three new faculty members. One, Michael Leka, who works on on coronaviruses and was the first person to show what the receptor was for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so he will be here in, in July. Stephanie Seifert is a disease ecologist, and this is exactly what she does. So she studies evolution of viruses within animal populations and look at how, does, how do new species uh, specific variants arise out of populations. So I asked her this question, and I actually kind of thought I'd get like a crisp yes, no answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a page here. <laughs> she says, in the weeds answer. So, but I won't give you that in the weeds answer. Um, so basically her answer, her answer is, yeah, maybe. Um, the, so we look to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the bats because other coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2, like SARS-CoV-1, are known to circulate within the, within the bat population, specific species of bats. And so they're, um, they're kind of the first easy hypothesis. Which is there's really no direct evidence that we know if it was either a primary source, and it probably wasn't, is more likely if it was a secondary source where the, where the virus probably evolved in another animal species that was picked up by bats and maintained within a bat population and then could have been could be transmitted. That's kind of the most likely scenario. Um, but there's no, no one has really found that that initial environmental reservoir. So pangolins were, were uh, they were hot for a little while because they found uh, SARS-CoV-2 kind of like viruses in, in, in some pangolins. Um, but the sequence of those actually was quite more divergent from the ones that's causing human disease than, the, than uh, some of the ones actually that are circulating within, within bats. So um, I, I think I think pangolins can be taken off the list as far as an, a, a, an initial reservoir or an initial host. But the question, the, the, but the, the answer is we still really don't know. It's, it's probably most likely that there was some animal host that the bats could have served then as a secondary uh, source and a, trans, and a point of transmission for the virus. But it's, that's a hard, it is, it's a hard question to answer. Well, I appreciate you trying. <laughs> um, certainly wonderful. You, you learned research. nothing from what I said. I managed to talk for five minutes and you learned nothing. Yeah. I learned it wasn't pangolins. Yeah. <laughs> no, wonderful research. And we're so excited about our new faculty members who will be joining us as well. Um, thank you all for bearing with us as we dealt with a few technical difficulties. Um, we are at time, so unfortunately we're going to um, have to end this conversation, but I wanted to say thank you to everyone who joined us and a huge thank you to Dr. Kalula and Dr. Amula for their time this afternoon. It's certainly fascinating and amazing the research that they're doing.
Um, we will continue to update foundation.wsu.edu slash fireside um, for the additional chats that we have scheduled. So please keep checking that. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.